So just to give you an idea of what we're going to do today and who we are, um, I'm um, uh, a former secondary school teacher, also taught grades six, seven, and eight um, with Thames Valley, but taught most of my time in Durham District. And uh, now I teach at the Faculty of Education at Ontario Tech, and we have a lab called the STEAM 3D Maker Lab. So with me today are Laura Morrison, Jennifer Robb, and Margie Lamb. And they're going to be facilitating some breakout sessions after I give some uh, uh, general comments about best practices for online teaching. And um, we just want to help. We want to be here to support teachers. Uh, I know there's a lot of uncertainty right now uh, about what this might look like. And I know that you're all at various stages uh, in your online journey. And I think maybe we can even think about it uh, not so much as uh, perfecting your online teaching uh, skills, but more how do we how do we teach in this sort of urgent emergency um, remote setting? And um, I think the the key a message to give you today is to keep it as simple as you can to begin. If you are more advanced or intermediate to advanced. Um, I'm hoping there'll be something for you here as well, but really what we want to do is um, share some best practices for online learning for students, as well as to uh, give you some direct hands-on um, practice with using some of the tools that you may be using um, as you, um, as you um, begin this online journey. So let me just... So I'm just gonna... Oh. Jen already did it. Um, there's the link to the bit.ly in the chat box. So if you guys, just before we get into the presentation, if you wanna click on the link in the chat box that will set up the slides on your own computer screen as well. Um, you may not need it as we're going through Jeanette's slides, but um, we'll need it later on for you to be able to access all the various links. Right, did you, um, did you put it in to the chat box too, Laura? Uh, I can. There's there's two different ones that we created, but uh, Jen's is active there. Okay. Um, and I'm seeing some of the chat. I, I do understand that Zoom, video conferencing in general may be off the table. I know that there are privacy issues, but I'll talk about that um, as we go here. So let's get started. Um, just to give you a sense of the agenda, um, we uh, I'm ho hopefully only going to talk for about 15 or 20 minutes and uh, just giving very basic um, tips about teaching online. Uh, and, and then uh, we're going to break you out into groups. You can decide which group you want to be in. Um, each of uh, uh, Margie and Laura and Jen will offer a different session. So there'll be one on Google Classroom, one on video conferencing, which as I said, may or may not be on the table. Um, for you, depending on your board. And um, the other one will be on video recording tools, ways that you can screen capture uh, some comments that you might want to give your students, or ways to narrate your slides if you use PowerPoint or Google Slides. So that's sort of what uh, what the, the session is going to look like. And I think the timing there is not quite accurate. We haven't run this before, so I'm um, not really quite sure exactly how the timing will work out, but really want to give you most of the time to be hands-on. Um, we are going to use a Padlet today to keep in touch with you. There's um, also the chat feature on um, Meet, but it would be great if we could put more detailed questions on this Padlet, and you'll see that there's a, a link there, and you should be able to click on that but if you can't, then you can, I think maybe Jen or Laura, you can grab it and put it in the, um, in the chat box as well. And we would like to kind of park your questions here so that we can answer them. Even if we don't get to them during the session, we can, um, you'll still have access to this Padlet and we can respond. Um, as we said, we're not quite sure exactly what kinds of support you need. So if that, uh, is something that you could share with us on this Padlet that will help us plan future sessions and even um, answer questions as we go through today. So I'm just going to give you a minute to see if you can uh, 
enter something on the Padlet so we know that it's active and working. And the way that a Padlet works, if you're not familiar with it, is you just have to open the link and then double click somewhere on the board there, the court board, and uh, you'll be prompted to add a title and a comment. Okay, so I'll leave you to, great. Uh, I'll leave you to, um, to keep that open in the background if possible, and uh, again, to add comments or questions as we go. Uh, so if you're new to online learning, there are the sort of a, a broad spectrum of ways that you can approach this. What I'm hearing from contacts at the ministry um, and, and what I'm hearing from friends, teacher friends in, in various school boards is that the, the province isn't giving you um, a, like a provincial mandate on exactly how to do this. This is being left in the hands of each school district. So I'm certain your boards will be in touch about what kinds of uh, tools will be available for you specifically. But broadly speaking, um, this, this is sort of the landscape that you see on this screen. And um, on the far right hand side, we have audio and video conferencing. And as I said, I'm guessing that, that there are privacy issues with that. I, I heard recently that Zoom is off the table. In fact, Zoom has been having um, some problems with um, people hacking into it. So it's, uh, it is one of the tools that we're going to look at today, but keep, uh, keep in mind that it may not be a tool that uh, you'll be able to use depending on which board you're in. Um, on the far left, so that's uh, synchronous learning. On the far left, you have um, low immediacy and high bandwidth. So asynchronous discussions, that could be on um, any kind of board, like Blackboard, um, Canvas, Moodle, any kind of learning system like that, a learning management system. Or it could be pre-recorded video that you uh, prepare ahead of time and post somewhere, like for example, on Google Classroom, um, or even just pre-recorded audio. Um, and then in the lower right quadrant, again, you're back to high immediacy. So group chat that is live chat and messaging back and forth, like the kind of things you do in, um, in obviously texting, but also uh, something like Google, um, sorry, Facebook Messenger um, and that kind of thing. And then um, on the far left the bottom, um, email, although I have to recommend uh, against giving students your email. Um, I, we're going to show you some better ways to do that. Otherwise, you're going to find you're overwhelmed and your in inbox will be inundated. Um, and it's very difficult to keep everything organized um, when students are emailing you. So we're really going to um, um, kind of encourage you to set up some kind of uh, uh, a learning system, whether it's Google Classroom um, or or uh, any, uh, there are various features that we will talk about as we go through. So the difference between synchronous, of course, is communication is occurring in real time. And the benefits are that the students get immediate feedback. You're, you're interacting with them at the moment. Um, it's more responsive in that sense. But one of the drawbacks is it, it could be hard for you to schedule a live meeting with all of your students. And examples of, of this would be Zoom and Meet and, of course, Skype. Um, asynchronous is probably more in line with what you're going to be um, expected to do. And again, I've mentioned Google Classroom. Um, your board might use Moodle or Blackboard or even Brightspace. Um, there are benefits for asynchronous uh, distance or learning, online learning. Uh, I like that there's a lot of time for students to reflect and sometimes you get deeper responses because they're given time to, to, um, to th really think about what they want to say. Uh, there's more flexibility for communication and um, one of the drawbacks though is that it's, it's, uh, you have to really stay on top of monitoring this kind of um, 
um, teaching because you you want to be you want to be timely, you want to be consistent, you want to be predictable about what uh, not only what your your expectations are, um, but when you're going to be available and all of those kinds of things, which I'm going to talk about in the tips. I do want to point out two very good uh, resources before we go any further, and this is the Online Learning Collective. So they have a Facebook group and they have a, a YouTube channel, and I would highly recommend bookmarking both of these because it is a, um, a, a virtual personal learning network, and if you, if you join, you'll get a lot of support that way as well. We will make these slides available to you as well. So if you miss clicking on something, you'll still have access to the slides. So I'm basing uh, the comments that I'm making on best practices for online teaching and learning um, primarily on the Wetcher's work from 2011, but also on 20 years, more than 20 years of teaching online experience that I personally have. I've been teaching online since 1997. Um, and um, I'm a, a huge proponent of teaching online. I think, I think it can be done really effectively, but I think there are some uh, uh, central ingredients that need to be present in order for it to work. And like all instructional approaches, it's not gonna work for every student. And I know that that was one of the, um, one of the concerns that teachers had um, you know, during the last few months as you've been um, trying to work out, um, negotiate a new contract and trying to fight for the best kind of quality ed education for your students as possible. So tip number one, really important to be present. In online teaching, you have to think about three things, three central things, teacher presence, social presence, which I'm gonna explain in a minute, and cognitive presence. So of course, teacher presence is is you know your role, your your um, being available, communicating regu regularly, being there to monitor discussion, um, setting very clear expectations and guidelines about when you're going to be available, um, and and setting up the infrastructure uh, for students, um, and trying if possible to to um, arrange either audio or video conferences with your students so that they uh, see you still. Um, you know, it could even be, if, you, if you're not able to do um, uh, synchronous learning, you may be able to uh, use a feature that, uh, you, where you can post pictures and, and uh, you, you can um, be present in that sense. Social presence is giving students the, uh, the time and the space and the ability to uh, to work together and to collaborate and to it's kind of like water cooler talk being able to um, work in small groups and then cognitive presence is the interaction with the subject matter or the content that you're teaching another really important and, and probably the most important thing in my eyes is to create a community you already have a community you've been working with these students um, prior to the, the, the shutdown of the schools. So you've already established a community, so you need to continue that community and continue to build that community online. And so as I said, if you can build in spaces for students to connect, um, ways for them to discuss, discussion forums, give them um, other collaboration platforms, and I would recommend asking the students what they would like to use. I know not a lot of students their age are on Facebook anymore, but they may choose to uh, set up a, a, you know, a page or a, a hashtag on Twitter where they can all kind of get together and share comments. Padlet is another good um, way to have them come together as a group. And again, try to have them connected to each other in small groups of two to four because that way they can support each other. Fewer questions to you fewer emails, um, but also they're going to need that social outlet as well. They're feeling isolated, not only from you as the teacher, but they're feeling isolated from their friends um, as well. Setting clear expectations is tip number three. Students always learn best when they're 
uh, learning content is organized in a consistent and logical way. So um, making sure that if you're using, for example, Google Classroom, that everything is uh, everything that's connected to assignments is in one area. Um, resources are in one area. And so that they don't have to scramble around looking for things. Um, when students um, have to look in various places, they, they become frustrated and uh, they suffer from cognitive load, cognitive overload. Um, so be consistent with deadlines. So if you want them to respond to somebody else's post or, pu or put a discussion post up, ask them to do it at the same time. So it's due every Monday by noon, for example, or every Friday by noon, X, whatever it is, is due. Um, and also be really consistent about how you're going to communicate with students so that they know when to expect to hear from you. And some of this applies obviously to um, not just to online teaching, but to teaching in general. And so it's not new for you. Variety is important. Um, it would be great if you could do a combination of synchronous and asynchronous. That may not be possible, but do try to add some kind of variety nonetheless, whether it's using um, different tools. But again, start simply. Don't, try, don't overwhelm them with a whole variety of tools. You know, go to the Padlet, then go to this polling tool, then, uh, you know, then go to this Flipgrid. It, it may be too much. You may want to um, choose one or two that you think are effective, and we're going to introduce you to some today. Um, so again, variety, small groups, large groups, and individual learning experiences are important. And obviously that's true for teaching face-to-face -face as well. Uh, working in teams is especially effective for assignments. Um, also cuts down on your working, your marking load. So giving students opportunity to work together on, for example, Google Docs on a, a written report um, is uh, a good way to get them communicating with each other. Regular check-ins, really important. You don't want them to feel like they've disappeared or you've disappeared into the void or they have. You know, they don't, you, they can't feel like that online learning is some kind of black hole. Um, I would ask students for informal feedback fairly early on. What is working for you? What is not working for you? What can we do to make this experience better for you? Um, and again, I would not recommend asking them to email this information to you. Set up a Google form, for example, to collect that information so it's all in one place and you can look at it all together. Um, and that should help you uh, tweak the things that you're doing for students. Make sure it's a better experience. Discussion prompts. Okay, I have <laughs> a lot of experience um, using discussion boards with students. And um, one, one of the things you really have to avoid is the hit and run, is what I call it, where you ask students to post about something. They go in, they, they make their post, and then you never see them again because they think that they've checked that off the box. That's not really a good way to get a conversation going. And unfortunately, it means that you as a moderator need to be present in the discussions. And um, I try not to jump in too early because I want to give them opportunities to discuss with each other before I weigh in. But when I do weigh in, I ask prompting questions to try to get them to think more about uh, uh, what, you know, what, what they're saying. Um, I also ask my students to respond to each other's posts. And, uh, and I actually evaluate that. I mean, we can talk about how you might do that. But you don't have to evaluate it. You can do, um, you know, have you been in? Have you been engaged in the conversation? Check, check, um, to make things a little bit less overwhelming. Um, but the key is getting them to, to make comments on their peers' posts in a meaningful way. So I say, you know, just saying, oh, yeah, I agree with Laura um, is not a meaningful post. They need to add something to the conversation. So I ask them to, to provide a question, make a comment, and, and ask a question that other students can then respond to. So obviously, open-ended questions are better, and these encourage critical and creative thinking. 
uh, easy access. Um, if, it's, if you can't uh, send a link to students, um, or if you can't, for copyright reasons, include the PDF itself, maybe try to find something else um, to, to send to them. Um, they're going to be dealing, they're going to be juggling a lot as you are. And the less obscure or the less difficult it is to find a, a resource or a reading or um, a video, the better it's going to be for everybody. Um, you don't want them to get frustrated and, and uh, basically opt out, give up. And then I think this is my last tip. Uh, you're not going to be able to walk around the classroom when students are working. Now, when you're in the in the class, you can you can you get a sense of 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 how they're engaging in, in their learning. So, how do you do that online? How do you make learning visible if you're not looking over their shoulders and being able to walk around and and, and check in and have you know brief conversations with them? Um, and one of the things that we do when we work with students is we ask them to record their thinking and their learning processes. So think of ways that you can get them to create and write and talk and explain and analyze and ask questions. Um, and whether that's done through writing or whether they take pictures of what they're doing, um, there are a variety of ways of doing that. Um, we uh, really favor project-based learning and that works really well in an online situation. In a course that I teach in the graduate program, I ask my students to keep um, a website. So they create a very simple website, either with Wix or Weebly um, or Google website. And they uh, sort of keep all of the artifacts of things that they've written or created or pictures that they've taken on that website. So there's this repository of their learning. It's kind of like a learning, a digital learning portfolio. Um, and you could do that too on Google Classroom, or you could uh, create a wiki for them so that they can actually comment back and forth on each other's. But it's also possible to do this in Google Drive. And um, I know some of you are probably doing that anyway, even in your everyday teaching. So I am going to turn things over to Margie. Um, we're uh, both Laura and I have taught in the Bachelor of Ed, Bachelor of Ed program, and I teach in the Grad program, and we both use the flipped learning model. On Thursday, Margie is doing a flipped session. Actually, she's doing a session on Scratch, coding with Scratch, and she's using a flipped um, um, approach. And so I'm going to just let her explain quickly what she's going to be doing. And, and I think it's a good current example of, of what you can do. So Margie, take it away. Thanks, Jeanette. Hope everyone can hear me. We're good? Uh -huh. OK, good. Um, OK, so uh, flipped classroom approach, for those of you who aren't as familiar with it, it is primarily where you uh, send out um, uh, maybe a video or some sort of presentation, a learning, uh, I, I did a learning video and with some challenges um, so that students could learn a concept before they actually come to class. Um, so that's the idea of the flipped classroom and the idea and what we hope to do is to be able to delve a little bit deeper into some of the material that we learned uh, versus having to go through a lot of maybe the basic um, concepts or um, a lot of introductory information. Um, so that, and the other reason I did it particularly for Scratch is because we have a, a group of users that may be at different levels. So by doing a flipped classroom, the idea is hopefully everybody sort of starts to come up to more of a mid ground um, where everybody may have a, a more of an understanding of the concept learned. Um, and then we can, our session can really be um, 
a great learning opportunity for everyone and uh, more critical thinking, trouble uh, creative, etc. Um, so those are the reasons you might want to do it. And that's what we're doing on uh, Thursday's session. Um, there are a lot of advantages, but there are a lot of disadvantages to that. I know that Jen will be discussing some of that in her session. Um, just quickly, one of the advantages is that um, it allows um, you to get deeper into material and start thinking about critical thinking questions and that kind of learning. Um, it, or the hope is, and that's sort of, there are negatives to that, which is, you know, if people don't do the flipped classroom approach before, uh, then you're stuck at the session and having to recap for those users that don't. So um, there's a lot of advantages and disadvantages, um, but I think that from an online learning environment, it, especially when you get, to, if you have a group of students and you get to know your students very well, this could perhaps work very, very well in the, in the class if you have a group of users or students that are are willing to try this kind of a, and you're willing to try it with them. Uh, so again, I will be doing it on Thursday um, uh, with Scratch. And I mentioned this key message right at the very beginning. Uh, keep it simple. Keep it simple, especially to begin. If you are able to do synchronous learning, there are a few things that I would recommend. Um, and I'm sure maybe Laura will touch on these as well um, in her session, but keeping cameras and mics to a minimum to avoid system overload. Um, I ask students only to put their cameras and their mics on, depending on the number of students in the session, um, only to put them on when they're speaking so that we can see them speaking. I, I also, if you're doing slides, and you have a video to show, I recommend not embedding it and showing it on your screen, but asking them to follow a link to the video and then have them come back in. If you know your video is seven minutes, say, go watch the video, then come back, let me know you're back. Um, the reason that we do that is sometimes when you try to sh play a video um, in depending on bed bandwidth strength and your students uh, access, um, sometimes it, it doesn't work, so it's just less complicated. Um, and then if you are using something like we are today, like Meet, um, I can't see, uh, when I'm presenting, I can't see the chat, which is not ideal. I right now can see that there are 60 messages in chat, but I can't see what they are unless I specifically go over there and click on that. So if you can find somebody, a helper, it's either a student or appear, you know, trade back and forth with each other to monitor your chat, that uh, definitely helps. And then on the right hand side of this screen, UNESCO has put together an online teaching guide, which I think is quite good. And I won't open it right now because I want to get you into your breakouts, but it is um, worth looking at because it lists a whole uh, array of different uh, tools that you can use for distance learning. So um, these are the sessions. Um, I'm going to give uh, Laura, Margie, and Jen an opportunity to just explain what they'll be doing in each of their sessions before you um, select which session you'd like to join. Okay, so I'll just um, give you a bit of an overview for the synchronous session. We're gonna focus mainly on Google Meet and the tools associated with the Google Suite. So I would recommend, just because this is going to be a hands-on session, if you don't have a Google account right now, you're still welcome to join, but you'll just be observing. You won't actually be playing around unless you create an account while you're in the group. So in order to maximize the Google Meet um, synchronous session, if if you have a Google account, that's my preference. Um, but obviously, if you if you just are interested to hear about things, you're welcome to watch what we're doing. But essentially, I'm going to go over how to set up a Google Meet, um, ways to use the various functions in Google Meet. And then um, I've embedded a whole bunch of links with ideas to how to use um, Google Docs, Slides, Forms, Google Keep um, in an online kind of setting. So that's, that's what Synchronous is going to be about. Thanks, Laura. Um, I'm going to uh, 
have the breakout session for Google Classroom. Um, so Google Classroom is that learning management system. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna give an overview. Um, I'm gonna show you, so hopefully again, this is one of the ones where you'll need a Gmail account. Um, so, and we'll provide an overview of Google Classroom. I'm going to um, show you how to uh, create a class as well as create some class work. But then I'm going to encourage you to actually try and navigate through and and see the different tabs and options available. And then we're going to come back and discuss questions and any thoughts or issues. And lastly, I'm going to, while you're discovering, one of the things I want to do is I'm not just going to show you the teacher view, but I'm going to actually also show you the student view. Um, because that's one thing a lot of times um, when I've done training is people see this, the teacher view, but they want wonder how the students will look. So we'll try to see if we can show you that in the session. Thank you, Margie. Um, so I have the last session on screen recording lesson content. Um, so basically what we're going to focus on there is we're going to talk a little bit more about um, what that might look like, why you might want to go about doing that. And then for the purpose of ease of use, we're going to really focus in on two tools that are easily accessible and um, pretty well free if you've, if you've got them. Um, we're going to look at primarily PowerPoint, and then we're going to look at Screencast-O-Matic. Um, so we're going to look at how you can use those to effectively take a capture of your screen and provide verbal narration, um, also possibly including your webcam in these recordings that you can then take and upload to be it a class YouTube channel, um, Google Classroom, or some other learning management system. Um, I also have some other links in there to some sort of more advanced platforms for recording that give you a little bit more flexibility and creativity, but those will mostly be to explore on your own time. Um, and I'm just going to address verbally in case anyone didn't see the chat, but we had a question as to whether or not the individual breakout sessions will be recorded. Um, they are going to be, and what we'll do is what we did similar with last week's session, is we're going to host all of these recordings on a page on the website. So you can kind of pick one of the meetings to attend live today, and then whatever you miss out on today, you can go back and review the recordings at a later time. Great. Thank you all. Um, so now's your time to decide. <laughs> so the rest of the session will be spent um, in one of these um, breakouts. So um, do, do you have the links or are they just gonna click on here? So the links are in the slides, um, but we could also, oh, in the bottom of the notes, somebody's just pasted them as well. Thank and you, Jen. Jen's just put them in the chat box. So the only thing is, um, Jeanette, for us to keep this main session recording, um, I can actually just stay in this main room for mine instead of people going to the first link for the synchronous. Um, that way, we'll have one continuous video file. Sure. Um, yeah, that's good. OK. So if you, if you want to do the synchronous meeting that Laura is leading, you're just going to stay here. And if you want to do one of the other two sessions, the links are either embedded in the slides or in the chat box. You can click on whichever one is interesting to you. And they will be recorded so you can view later. Um, Laura, do you want to see if um, you can round up the other two groups? Yeah, I just sent them a Slack message to see if they can come back now. Yes, yeah, Stephen, I have a similar concern. And in fact, in the information that I was reading, uh, the um, the article said that the the expectation is for teachers to spend the majority of their time on science, math, literacy, and social studies. And so, as always, the arts basically gets short shrift, um, phys ed. So I guess those are the kinds of things that are going to have to be taken up. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, parents will take those up and ensure that those things are happening. But it, it, it really indicates what we value um, in our or what our government values, which is uh, unfortunate. I agree, Trisha. 
I love the Finland model, you know, where they there's so much outside time, even with like recesses, not just two 15 minute breaks in a day. Hello, Nicole. So it seems like people are starting to come back. Hi, Vic. Who oh, Jason? Yeah. That's tough. Yeah, Jason. I'm. I'm. I'm wondering. You know, one of my one of my wonderings uh, about all of this is how are they going to ensure that there's equity, especially in elementary school, where where uh, you know homeroom teachers teach the bulk of the of the program and um, teachers who come in to do coverage, whether it's music, French, art, um, what will their role be? Because they have committed, the government has committed not to laying anybody off. So I, I hope that those students who have EAs will still have access to their EAs and that they will have some kind of a role to play. Um, but I, I agree with you, um, the students who are on IEPs uh, and depending, you know, of course, on what their challenges are, are are very vulnerable at this at this point, and that's very concerning. Yes, Vic, um, I as a, as am I am very concerned about the same thing, um, ensuring that uh, a lot of our students don't fall through the cracks, and. You know, we, as we know, um, some of the parents um, of some of our students who struggle don't have the means to, to, you know, to purchase all the additional resources and technology that students will need to be successful in this sort of new learning model. So, Jeanette, you said you were able to um, have... I said yeah, I started working on some of the, although I don't see my responses here. Did no. you refresh that? Um, you have to like click off. You may have um, added a comment without maybe clicking off the box and that's why it's not appearing. Aha. Are they coming up now? Yep. Um, I mean, as I said, without knowing the specific context, it's hard to give more detailed advice. Um, I didn't get to all of the questions yet, um, but we will we'll, uh, come back to them. Um, in terms of the top right one, the, my class is paperless. Awesome, congratulations, I love that. Um, do I need to make any adjustments to the way I teach? Um, I, I would think that, that the fact that you're already paperless is uh, going to be a huge advantage in teaching in this new, so I don't think so, I mean, um, you know, even something like this, Padlet, students can still write and share and, and um, they're going to be doing, they're going to be sending assignments, depending on what you're teaching, they're going to be sending assignments uh, electronically as well. So, um, again, you know, <laughs> For some students who don't have access, they may have to go back to the sort of old correspondence course model where things actually get mailed out um, for students. But, uh, you know, again, the, con the concerns about equity and uh, accessibility and are they going to get as, as good a quality education as um, the rest of the students who have computers and other devices it's yeah quite concerning um there was a math question where is it that yeah, i thought I Mar it. yeah margie i thought you might take a stab at that one is margie back um there are 
there are uh, right here. Oh, Sorry. okay. Hi. There are whiteboards that um, would be would be excellent for math. Um, I actually have a resource um, that uh, I created with tons of online math um, apps, um, you know, Desmos, GeoGebra. Um, there's so many uh, in this resource. So I thought instead of going through each one, I could send you the link. And if you have any questions, you can update it on the Padlet. Um, but I'm going to add the, the link here now. Um, it be, and, and it's um, because I think with math, there's really some great opportunities uh, to be able to uh, to use some online learning. Uh, so let me add this in here. And uh, if you if you do want to open it up and look through it, um, it's called Chromebooks with Intermediate Math, but essentially. It is um, various different um, either learning management, fully learning management systems, or uh, online apps, or s different software that you can even um, download. Uh, but most of it is online. And uh, it looks at everything from one of the apps I love is QThink. Um, there is a, a cost to that. Um, but if you go to, if you are looking at this, I would look in the later slides because what we've done is we've sorted it, it by unit. So if you're looking for data management and probability, there's different apps there, different simulations. Uh, Gapminder is another one. If you're looking for number sense and numeration, uh, we have ones there. Um, and geometry and spatula sets, we've got Desmos here, Geo. Geo GeoGebra <laughs> and very measurement. There's various different ones. So please take a look at this. Um, again, if you have any questions about it, you can let us know. Um, one of the ones I really want to point out that I that was really exciting to me when I was sort of looking through, and it's one called Get the Math 13. And this is a really unique way of looking at math. Um, what it does is it's a website. And it uh, looks at um, some ways that real life careers incorporate math. So they look at uh, basketball players um, and some of the reporting and how they use it for statistics. And then they pose questions to students. They look, there's ones for special effects. Um, so your job is a special effects and how they use math. One for fashion design. So really interesting uh, resources for teaching math. And um, yeah, hopefully yeah. it helps. I added one to uh, a resource too that um, my husband actually uh, has a math website. He's a math education professor at Western and used to be a math consultant in Durham. So lots and lots of activities there that you could hook your students up with. Um, for the person who was posting about drama and theater, what grade are we talking? Uh, it's grade nine and 10. Okay, so if you, um, I used to teach uh, dramatic arts in high school as well, and actually wrote the curriculum for Western's online drama courses. So if you um, uh, tell me what your units are, your modules are left to cover, I can probably give you some ideas, but it is going to be different for them. I think what you're gonna look at is having them do um, a lot of work, um, at home and video recording. And of course, drama is very much about collaboration. Very few things we do in drama is, is, are done alone with one student. So that's gonna be problematic as well. It will be an adjustment. But the only thing is like, what stands out for me is if each student is recording um, a piece separately, in their own homes and then one student is able to um, take all of the videos if it's a group assignment and then make some sort of like digital composition like there's ways that you can actually get really creative with that kind of thing no i think i think that's true yeah absolutely even even creating something like um you know using something like flipgrid would work too yeah 
uh, creating mashups. Like it would, it's, you know, drama just in a digital kind of platform. If you wanna, if you wanna connect with us later, like I have lots of ideas. To me, drama is like a, a fairly, it, it's, a, it's a good one for me to kind of take on because I, I'm thinking of a lot of creative ways that you can really leverage digital media and digital technology. So it's not the in-person dramatic arts, but done slightly differently. I am conscious of the time. It's two minutes past three. And I want to thank everybody for, uh, for coming. And again, you know, once you find out what your board is being asked to do, we'd be happy to offer um, additional, more focused sessions um, if there's a need for that. So please stay in touch and best of luck to you. Um, we're living in very interesting times. So take care of yourself and don't put too much pressure on yourself or your or your kids. This is the key word I think for now is compassion. Mm -hmm.